Well, we are uh, one Sunday away from finishing up uh, what we call our summer series, and that is uh, Hopeland. And I think that because of all the voices in our world, in our culture, and that we, uh, we, we have a deficit of hope in our, in our world. We have a deficit of hope oftentimes in our own lives. And, uh, and there's plenty of things to focus on that, uh, that can drain that hope from us that we do have. But what we're hoping to do through this summer um, is to help us understand that our hope is not, what, what our hope is based on and what it's not based on. And, uh, and so sometimes whenever we, uh, we think of hope, we think of it more in a, a light version of that, wishful thinking. Um, but the hope that the Bible talks about is a certainty. But what I uh, want to share with you is the fact that, that hope is something that we can have, we are certain about. And it's certain not because of anything really based on us. Uh, it is based on God's glory, his power, his might, who he is. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a difference between optimism and, uh, and hope. I prefer to be around somebody who's optimistic than somebody who's pessimistic. But at the same time, optimism ha does have its limits. Is optimism is basically kind of a, a psychological perspective. Uh, hope is based on a theological perspective. It's based on who God is. Um, and optimism is basically kind of choosing to have a good outlook on life, and that's a good thing. But, uh, but hope is choosing to have an absolute trust in the living God. And, um, and, and sometimes optimism will say, you know, I, I've I'm, uh, been known to, you know, to do a little smack talk when it comes to sports. And the truth of the matter is I'm not all that great at sports, but I'll, I'll still like to do a little smack talk about it. And so, so sometimes you can say, you know, I, I know some people think, well, he's very overly optimistic about his ability. Well, I just enjoy the camaraderie that occurs from that but um but really but hope is not based on your best idea of what you can do uh hope is based on your best understanding of what god can do and uh and and so it's trusting god to bring us through it's not just denying that there's difficulties sometimes when we're just optimistic we we kind of have that view of going well i'm not gonna i'm gonna act like everything's okay and uh and it really isn't Hope doesn't act like everything's okay. It says everything's not okay right now, but I know the God who is greater than what's not okay, and that's where my trust is. And so if you look at your memory verse at the top of the sheet, um, if you have a sheet near you, you can grab that. It says, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, your faith and hope can be placed confidently in God. So one of the very core confidences we have in um in, in having ex experiencing hope is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. What is it that gives us that certainty that we can trust God, that we can trust him with today, we can trust him with next week, we can trust him with our future. And so the basis of our hope is in the person of Jesus Christ and what he came to accomplish uh, and, and the fact that not only did he come and adequately die for our sins, but he rose again which in that resurrection lets us know that even the greatest and most powerful thing in this life is, is, is not enough, but he made a way beyond this life to the eternal uh, through his resurrection power. And so our hope is based on his ability to do more than we can imagine or think. His, our, 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 our hope is based in the fact that he is more powerful uh, than life and death, and that's our confidence. And so I want to give you uh, three lessons from uh, the last part of the book of John, the Gospel of John. And uh, two of them are found in John 20, and one is found in John 21. And if you have your notes there, and uh, we don't have every verse listed in here, so if you're following along the scripture, you'll see we jump a little bit. Uh, if you're following, if you open up your Bible, that's, that's fine. Uh, you'll get the full story there. But we, for the sake of time, uh, didn't put every verse in um, on your sheets, and that's what we're going to go from. Uh, the first person that we're going to look at here, and this is the resurrection story. I know you say, well, today's not Easter. Well, every Sunday is resurrection Sunday because Jesus rose on the first day of the week, and every time we come together, one of the amazing things about coming together on a Sunday is this, that we're making the statement that we believe that God is alive, that Jesus is alive, that he rose from the dead. And in fact, if you didn't believe that, I don't know that you would bother pushing out of bed 
and showing up on a Sunday morning to church. And uh, unless you were trying to understand, is that really true or not? And trying to search the truth about that. And so these three people experienced the resurrection of Jesus in a very upfront and close and personal way. But they did it in a moment of great hopelessness. They, 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 they experienced this at a time whenever it seemed like everything in their world had, had stopped, had, had come to a stop that was of value to them, that they had invested themselves into. So the first one's Mary Magdalene and the fact that she felt hopeless. And so let's look at the passage. Mary Magdalene stood crying outside the tomb. While she was still crying, she bent over and looked in the tomb and saw two angels dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? She answered, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. Now, let me just talk to you for a moment about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene uh, was a person whose reputation was uh, not the best in the world. There were, uh, she had a, she had a, a challenging history, relationship-wise. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes, you, you know, when you see the dedication that she had to Jesus, and you see the 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 love that she poured out toward him. Uh, I think part of that is because of the fact, not only because her sins were forgiven, but because this is the first time maybe in her whole life where a man had not met her only for what he could get from her. But this was someone who loved her for who she was, accepted her with her past and everything, and embraced her for where she was and was willing to take her to a new place and uh, a place of freedom, a place of forgiveness. And so Mary Magdalene had been forgiven a lot. She had experienced a lot. She had been down some pretty tough roads, and Jesus had brought her hope. She was actually at the cross when he was crucified. There were other some of the disciples that were actually hanging out in the distance and kind of staying out of the way, and they were, they were scared, rightfully so. But Mary Magdalene was right there at the foot of the cross. She was a committed follower of Jesus and uh, and and her love for him is undeniable. So it's not any great question to us why she would be crying, uh, but she specifically stated she didn't know she even though she was weeping she was uh, she was certainly grieving because of his death, but she also now didn't even know where he'd been placed, where he'd been moved to, and so uh, that's double upsetting to her. So her world's pretty rocked right now, and so she turned around and saw a man standing there. But she didn't recognize that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. So she said to him, if you took him away, sir, tell me where you have put his body, and I will go and get him. Then Jesus simply said to her, Mary. Now let me ask you this. If you call your spouse on the phone, and of course, I know we have staticky reception sometimes, and there's, you know, you have to do that. Are you there? Are you there? That kind of thing. But I'm just saying, if it's a clear signal and you call your spouse on the phone, and they answer, most of the time they don't have to say, "Who is this?" Right? They recognize your voice. We, we, there's a certain set of people, especially specific family members, that we recognize their voice right on the phone. We recognize immediately when they speak to us. We know who it is. We don't have to ask who it is. When Jesus said Mary, all of her wondering about what, where he was and who had put him where was gone in that second because she recognized his voice. And I know this will surprise you, but um, sometimes I drive through Dunkin' Donuts on the way to church to get um, the kids something on their way, something nutritious on their way to church. Uh, and... Um, in the day, the the morning shift guy there, his name is Josh, and uh, and he's been working for Dunkin' Donuts a long time. He's worked in store down by twenty in different places, so uh, we've known each other pretty well. But I'll I'll pull up and I don't even order my I don't even really order coffee on Sunday mornings. I really don't have time to do it justice in the sense of uh, sitting there enjoying my coffee. So I don't I just get them something, and uh, but when I order, he will say typically speaking, something along these lines. He'll say, is that all you want today, Rod? And at first, Skylar was just fascinated that this guy knew me. You know, like, well, how does he, 
how does he know you? You know, are you the president of the United States? You know, when she was a little kid, you know, it's like, what is this? this is amazing. And uh, so, but, but we, where we frequent places, where we end up interacting with people, we, we recognize people's voices, in particular in our families, we recognize. So when, when Jesus simply said to her, Mary, she spun around toward him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. She immediately realized this was the one she was looking for. He was alive. Now, her hope was renewed instantly, even though she had been weeping, even though she was in heavy sorrow, even though she was now concerned where his, has his body been taken, just at the sheer mention of her name, when he called her by name, all of that sorrow, all of that just dispelled and hope came and filled her, her teacher, her Lord, her Savior was there and he was alive. And so Mary ran and found the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. Now, I just want to mention a couple of things here in, in passing. Uh, one is, whenever we talk about the resurrection, there's, there are a lot of people who doubt the resurrection. A lot of people in the world who doubt that Jesus, they may think he was a good teacher, this or that or the other, but they, they just think the resurrection is taken a little bit too far. Now, here's what I want to tell you. It, your confidence in who God is is based on what you know about him and how what you believe about him. And if you believe God is the God of the Bible, then it shouldn't be too big of a jump for you to believe that he could raise be raised from the dead. But uh, but for those who struggle with that, I you know I, I certainly um, don't put that struggle down, and uh, and I think it's a very important thing to have an honest search for it. But one of the reasons, one of the things about I love about the Bible, and that is this: the Bible isn't cheesy about anything. In other words, you would think if the Bible was trying to prove itself to be some great holy book, that it would only tell the good stories, right? It would only tell the stories where everybody got it right. You know, only people like Joseph and Daniel would be a very, very small book because only people like Joseph and Daniel would make it in because they, they about got it right every time, it seems like. And so most of the other stories are filled with people who didn't get it all right. In fact, they got about as much wrong as they got right, and then they got a lot right, but they still messed up a lot. And so the Bible's filled with that. But also when it comes to this issue of the resurrection, the Bible also is very straightforward. It's not like it's actually not trying to prove some point. Because if this was being written in such a way as to absolutely prove to people this, this, this proof, um, not being able to in any way find anything, they would never have used a woman as the first person to be a witness. Now, this isn't against any woman here or anything like that, but in that time period, a woman not, was, not was not a witness, was not somebody who was a valid witness. And so for her to be the one who first witnessed Jesus, that would not have been the scheme. That would not have been the way this was written. Uh, there would, we, we would have had some of the disciples being the very first ones there. And, uh, and they did show up, and they came out there, but Mary Magdalene in, in, in is, is, is the one who was the first witness now, that's not a very good plan for a defense plan, but it's a really good plan for revealing God's heart and his story and the truth of him. Because, see, Mary had spent much of her life as a bit of an outcast because of the lifestyle she chose, because of the way she had lived her life, because of the way things had gone. Jesus gave her dignity. Jesus loved her because of who she really was, not just for the actions that she had committed, not for the, the seeking of love in all the wrong places that had happened with her. And uh, because of that, she actually rose up and, 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 and believed him and believed she could be forgiven and believed that her life could be different. And she began to live that life differently. And what I want to tell you is this. The hope that God brings to us through Jesus Christ, is this. It's never too late for a miracle. It's never too late for a miracle. And sometimes we look at situations and we go, I just don't have any hope for that person anymore. I just don't believe that person's ever going to change. I don't believe the situation's ever going to change. And you know what? 
based on the information we have, probably it's a good reason for us to feel that way. But even with all the chips down, even with Jesus having died on the cross and Mary saw it with her eyes, even though him having been buried and she knew where he's buried, she went to the tomb and then he wasn't even there. Even in the midst of all that uncertainty, all that loss, Jesus revealed himself to her and hope appeared. Now, I just want to tell you, God, I mentioned last week, God is here. When we gather in his name, he's here, okay? God isn't God isn't off someplace going, I hope you're having a good time over at Westtown today. He's not saying that about any church. If people gather in his name, he's there. So he's here this morning. He's with us. And one of the things he wants to do is reveal his presence to us. Now, I, I'm kind of cautious sometimes about saying too much in the sense of, um, you know, how I interact with God from the standpoint of, I, I think that each of us have to understand and know how to hear God's voice. And when I say that, I'm not, I'm not talking about an out loud voice, but be persuaded in our spirit that we've heard God's voice. But um, I was, d- just to share this really, just to, to, to give you an example really of just, uh, and I wish I could say this happens every day for me. It doesn't happen every day for me, but I'm thankful for when God does reveal himself in this way. Um, I had, um, come by, I, I was at the church and had come in and just to spend a little bit of time alone with God. And uh, in uh, there talking to him about a lot of things that are on my heart, my mind, a lot of things for the church, a lot of things for you guys, just talking to God about things. And sharing requests, listening, that kind of thing. Just a, it, was, it, was, it was a pretty broad-based prayer. But when I left, the thing, before I left, the thing that I was most grateful for was we, we sing about it this morning, and the Bible talks about the fact that he gives us peace beyond our ability to comprehend. But the peace of his presence was very strong. You say, well, what, did you hear a voice? Did you? No, I didn't hear a voice. But undeniably in my spirit, I knew that God was with me. He was with me. You know, it it wasn't as visible as Mary's situation here. It wasn't as plain as that. I didn't hear my name called out, but I felt loved by him. I felt embraced by him. I felt like he cared about the things that I was talking to him about. And it changed my perspective in that moment. It changed. And I just want to tell you, God is nearer than we think. You know that Mary was standing there in deep sorrow, and she was explaining her pain to the people, to the angels. And she turned and started explaining it to this guy she thought was the gardener. You know, she didn't realize just how close Jesus was to her. She didn't realize until he called her name. Can I tell you, whatever you're going through, whatever it is that you might be experiencing, that maybe you're thinking, you know, I, I, this is just never going to work for me. I'm never, I'm going to, I'm going to feel hopeless about this the rest of my life. I'm not saying God's going to give you the solution today, but I'm going to tell you what I believe God wants to do. I think if you would pause and listen and call out to him, what he does want to do is to let you know that he's a whole lot closer to you than you might realize. In fact, the Bible says that he's close to the brokenhearted. And so if you're in a tough spot, in a hard place, in a challenging time, I want you to know, if you want to know where God is, he's right there with you. He was right there with Mary, even though she was looking for him. And I think there's been so many times whenever I've been walking around looking for God, God, where are you in this? Where are you in that? I can't, what, what's going on over here? What's happening there? What is, the, what's this about? I, I believe in so many times that I've done that, way more than I would like to admit, where I think if God, he does have a great sense of humor, I do believe, but I believe he was, like my son Hunter, what he would do is, while I'm doing that, he would just go, boo, scare me. He's that close. See, the truth is he's there. He's here. He's here for you right now. Whatever it is you're in, and I just want to tell, I want to remind you, Mary was desperate. She was, she was upset, rightfully so. And she didn't realize how close Jesus was. 
God, please help us to believe you're here with us. Help us to believe that you really care. Help us to believe and embrace that. And help me help all of us to do that, Jesus. The second person is Thomas. Thomas also felt hopeless. Have you ever felt left out before? Don't raise your hand, but I know you have. Sometime at some point, you felt left out before. And uh, Thomas had that experience. And uh, he, he was, he was kind of left out of a very important event. And so follow along as I read uh, the passage from John chapter 20 again, beginning at verse 19. It says, that evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors. Now remember, this is after Jesus has been raised from the dead because they were afraid of the religious leaders. They were meeting behind closed doors because they were afraid. They were next. I mean, if your leader had been killed, you might think we're next. So suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. I always am intrigued how when God scares us, he always tries to encourage us not to be afraid. You know, you, you, you know, said many, many times, when you read the words in the Bible, don't be afraid, it's because you really naturally should be very afraid. But he's saying, don't because I'm in the midst, I'm here. Um, so he was standing there among them saying, peace be still, peace be with you. <clears throat> and he spoke, as he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his side. They were all filled with joy when they saw their Lord. But one of the disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. And you would think he maybe would have said, oh, awesome, that's cool. Here's what he said, I won't believe it. Unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Now, Thomas sometimes gets a little bit of a bad rap in the Bible because he, you know, what, what do we call him? What, is it, what do most people call him? Doubting Thomas. Well, you all know that. And, uh, and, and so, Doubting Thomas. But let me, let me just mention to you that sometimes uh, a Doubting Thomas we'll get some answers that people who just assume everything is, you know, like it ought to be, uh, won't get. And so uh, so what, what, what I want to encourage you to do is look a little deeper at who Thomas is. I think Thomas was an introspective person. He, he looked carefully at things. He was a person, I think, that felt deeply about things. And, uh, and in his mind, it just was delusional for these guys to say that they had seen Jesus. And, uh, and I'm sure they'd said, hey, we, we saw his side. We touch his hands, and I mean, we know it was Jesus. We're telling you it was Jesus. But he says, I'm, I won't believe it unless I see it. You guys said the advantage of seeing it. I have to see it with my own eyes. Now, the important thing about doubting Thomas, and I really, uh, I, I don't like to use that word exactly with him because he was, he was a skeptic, in, but skeptics can be just skeptics for the sake of being skeptics, but they can also be skeptical because they just, when they believe, they believe strongly, and they want to know for sure. They want to know as much as possible. And so Thomas, this isn't the only time in Scripture where he asked tough questions. He did in John 14 as well. And, uh, and, and so in doing so, sometimes we get some of the best responses. But, but I will tell you, a, a person who has doubts never concerns me. But a person who's dishonest in their doubting that's a great concern because the truth of the matter is you might never find the truth if you're not really looking for it. And if you're just, you just are doubting just to doubt because you don't want to bother with, that's not a good thing. But an honest doubter, in my opinion, will almost always find the truth. So if you're an honest skeptic, I like honest skeptics because I think honest skeptics, whenever they come across the truth, they're firm in their faith, firm in their belief. And so um, let's go on and see what happens. Eight days later, now, this went on for eight days. You know, at some point, you could have thought Thomas might have said, well, okay, guys, you've convinced me. Okay, I'm, I, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll accept it. Uh, I'll just go along. But it doesn't appear that he did. Eight days later, over a week, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. He said, peace be with you. It sounds like the same story over, right? Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. 
Put your hand into the wound in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. See, an honest doubter, when they see the truth, they will stop doubting. And, uh, and so what happens is Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Now, that phrase, I was uh, seated with uh, a good a couple good friends of mine from Bible College. We had run into uh, some people from an organization that um, does a lot of work in communities as far as trying to win converts. And, uh, and they do not believe that Jesus is God. And so we had bumped into them. We were out uh, in the neighborhood, my friends and I were, and uh, interacting with some people about spiritual things. And uh, we run in, ran into them, and we got into this huge discussion with them. Um, they invited us another day to their house. We went, and, um, and in the process, one of the things that my, one of my friends pointed out, we, we, uh, the way the conversation started was, we're going to go through one of the Gospels in the New Testament we'll, and point out the things that we believe prove that Jesus really was God. And uh, at the end of that, if you think we're right, then, you know, we, that's great. If you don't, then we'll just agree to disagree. But that's how we'll meet you on that basis. So we met them on that basis. They allowed us to do that. We walked through. And uh, one, of the, one of my friends said, uh, it brought to this passage, and he said, Thomas said, not only my Lord, but he said, my God to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And that's a connected and. It's not, you know, uh, something that's some other, other type. And, uh, and this individual who had been arguing with every point that we'd made all the way through, or a couple, about three of them too, could argue with every point. We weren't doing a very good job of convincing them, I can tell you that, even though we, we became more convinced than ever by the time the evening was over. But he said, I know what's going on there. Thomas said, my Lord, and then he swore and said, my God. He said, well, nice try, but we don't think that was the case. We think he was clearly identifying who he believed Jesus to be. So, uh, so G Jesus said, you be believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. You know, and every person here who's a believer you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You believe not because you met Jesus physically, but because you believe the record, because you believe the testimony of those who have gone behind, because you believe the Bible is true. You've come to believe and receive that this truly is uh, the, the, the answer, that the resurrection is proof that the living God has plans for us, not only in this life, but for all of eternity. And so it's never too late to start believing. It's never too late to start believing. Thomas didn't start believing in the sense of the resurrection until eight days later. He, he, he wanted proof. He wanted to see with his own. He wanted to touch with his own hands. He wanted, he, wanted, he wanted proof. And I just need to tell you, Jesus, even though he did tell him to stop doubting and believe, and, uh, and, and you know, he, he did the same thing for Thomas that he did for the others. He showed him his wounds. And it uh, wasn't just for Thomas. He did that with the others as well. Uh, he, so he, he proved himself to them as well. It's just they had that eight-day advantage. But when Thomas saw, even though he was eight days late in believing the resurrection, he started believing. And I just want to tell you that it doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, a child, a teenager, a young adult, a middle-aged adult, an older adult, whatever you are, there's never a bad time to start believing that Jesus rose from the dead and that he's provided eternal life for you. There's never a bad time to start believing. And, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's just never too late. And, and one, of the, one of the thieves on the cross beside Jesus, as he was just almost gasping his last breath, he reached out to Jesus and he saw him as his hope. He believed in him as his hope. And I just want to tell you that, that he is still the hope. He's your hope. He's my hope today. And, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of things in our world that create a lack of hope. But the one thing that we can hold on to as believers is the fact that Jesus really is alive. And because of he's alive, we not only live now, but we will live with him forever and ever and ever. The third person that felt hopeless was Simon Peter. Now, Peter... 
as you well know, is, you know, most people are pretty familiar with him as a disciple, too, because he was very outspoken. And he'd said some bold things like, you know, I'll die for you. I'll die. You know, I won't. I'll never deny you all these kinds of things. But he did deny Jesus. He actually denied that he had followed Jesus. He d denied that he had known him and been with him. And uh, this is a, a, a spot where Jesus, he and, he and Peter confront a little bit about this and deal with this. And... Um, and set some things right. And so if you look at John 21, uh, beginning at verse 1, it says, Later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him. Then Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Then he asked him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you really love me? Peter was grieved that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. Isn't that interesting? So, when I, I, you know, I know your questions don't mean you don't know the answer. You already know the answer. But you must want to hear me say it. You must want to hear me speak it out loud. And uh, I, I, and Peter, Peter, he, he really had that one right. He goes, Lord, you, you know everything. And the most important thing is, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Now, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Jesus gave him an opportunity to state his love three times. And I know there's different words in the Greek for the love there, and that's just not a part of the lesson today. But what Jesus did for Peter was walk him back to a fresh start. And I just want to tell you, it's never too late for a fresh start. It's never too late for a fresh start. God, through the person of Jesus Christ, came to this earth to die for your sins, to die for my sins. He came to this earth to walk among us and reveal God to us, to show us the heart of the Father, to show us what God is really like. And he came and walked among us and died for us so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that the punishment of our sin was on him. And then... Through his resurrection, he demonstrated that we get to live with him forever and ever. How long, how short this life is, whether you live to be 25 years old or you live to be 105 years old. The truth of the matter is that Jesus came to give us a fresh heart. We call it in the Bible, we call it being born again. That's what the Bible calls it. It's being born again. It's not just uh, turning over a new leaf. You know, fresh, God's fresh start is not just, I'll just turn over a new leaf. We just, just start over tomorrow. It is brand new. It is something brand new. It's being born again. Now, Nicodemus, who was a smart man, and he was a theologian, and he, was, he had some trouble with that description that Jesus was giving him. And he's saying, how can I enter into my mother's womb and be born again as an adult? And he's saying, no, we're talking about a spiritual birth, a spiritual birth. And I, I just want to tell you, the fresh, God gives us many fresh starts. There's many, many times. And, and sometimes we need them. Maybe we've been a, a follower of Jesus. We've, we've actually been someone who's really endeavoring to please him, to honor him with our lives, to, to grow in him, to be a learner, to be a disciple of Jesus. And, um, and we're, we're doing that. But there's also times sometimes when it gets very lean, when we're really just coasting along. And sometimes we need a fresh start. And uh, that doesn't mean you have to be born, born again all over again. But what it does mean is, in this case, you may have to reconcile some things with God. I believe Peter was a believer, but he had sinned horribly against God by denying that he even knew Jesus. He had, he had done wrong. And Jesus, in his graciousness, leads him through a path of repentance of saying, Peter, I just want to go, I want you to go on record here. Do you love me? Do you love me? And he didn't say, 
well, since you denied me, um, you know, you're pretty worthless to me anymore. What did he say? He said, feed my sheep. I, I have something I need you to do, Peter. Let's get back on board. Let's get our faith reignited. Let's get ourselves in the place of openness between you and me. So he gave him a fresh, fresh start just simply means we get things right in our life. Fresh start means we get things right. But the very greatest fresh start is whenever we're born again. Whenever we actually take that step of saying, I believe that Jesus is my Savior, and I believe that he is not only the Savior of the world, but he's personal to me. He came to redeem me from my sins. He came to set me free. I have a verse of scripture that I want to read to you. It's a familiar one. This translation shares it in a little more of an explanatory note. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, whenever anyone puts their total trust in Christ, they become a completely new person. They aren't the same anymore. The old way of living disappears. They get a fresh start and a brand new life. You know, I'm going to pray about three different prayers here this morning as we conclude this time. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, to carefully examine in your own heart where you find yourself at this place. You may feel like you're in a fresh start time. You may feel like your relationship with God is just where, in a sense, it needs to be. Not that it's ever completely there, but I'm saying you're on track with God. And if that is, I just want to celebrate that with you today and say, you know, God, keep you strong. You know, and, 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 and keep yourself in the right places, doing the right things, and uh, keep that walk with God very active. But there might be some here today who would say, you know, I, 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 I've been born again. I truly believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. I believe he's my Savior, and I've asked him to forgive my sins, and I've invited him into my life, and I have started that journey of faith. But I'll be honest with you, it's gotten kind of foggy in here. And I don't mean this in this building, I'm just saying in your life. Jesus has become a little bit distant to me. And uh, I'm just doing life. I'm not really doing it with Jesus. I'm just doing life. And I've let some things come in. I've let some things enter into my life that really aren't good practices or good things to have a part of my life as a one who follows Jesus. And I do need a fresh start. I need to get, as, as Peter did, I need to get some things right with God. I need to I need to correct course here. I need to set some things in the right place. And I'm going to pray for that. And then there might be others who would just say, you know what, I have never in my life been able to lay down my life and give it to God. I, I either, either doubts like Thomas had or fear of control or uncertainty I've just never been able to do that. And I'm going to pray that today you could do that, that you could literally lay down all your defenses, lay down all the things that hold you back from trusting. And just like the man on the cross who was near Jesus, who was dying, he was, he was, he was dying. But he said, you know what? I, I, that, other guy's, that other guy's cursing him. But for some reason, I'm thinking this guy here is my hope. This person in the middle is my hope. This person of Jesus Christ, the living son of God, the one who, not at that moment, but the one who three days later rose from the dead and, and declared defeat over the grave. And I just want to say, if you've never done that or you feel unclear about that, I don't want you to doubt your salvation. But if you feel unclear about that, let's get clear about it today.